One thing I've always found interesting is how much and Caligon the Black has bled into fantasy pop culture, despite, you know, being mentioned only twice in Tolkien's main books, once in The Lord of the Rings and once in The Silmarillion, where he is literally killed in the same sentence he was introduced. Normally, characters who are introduced solely for the sake of dying aren't that popular, unless they're red shirts from Star Trek, but Ancalagon is a giant dragon. He's massive, the size of a mountain. But is he the size of a mountain? Did Tolkien ever actually tell us how big Ancalagon was? Is it possible that we, the fans, may have taken this one a bit too far? In this episode of Middle Earth Mysteries, how big is Ancalagon the Black? Make no mistake, this is the art piece that is responsible for Ancalagon's popularity, even outside of the Tolkien fanbase. And Ancalagon's size in this art piece has been taken as canon by many fans. It's absolutely epic, but just how accurate is it? Alright, so we have two hints for Ancalagon's size. The first is that he was the mightiest of the dragon host Morgoth unleashed at the end of the War of Wrath. Not much of a hint. Mightiest may mean largest, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean the largest. The second is the infamous line of Ancalagon's death, and he fell upon the towers of Fangorodrim and they were broken in his ruin. Okay, that doesn't leave much room for argument, right? He was so big that he crushed three mountains as he died, or at the very least, he did massive amounts of damage to Fangorodrim. Therefore, maybe that art piece is actually correct, but is it really that simple? Let's look at some of the evidence that would suggest it isn't that simple, and that Encalagon the Black was not as big as everyone believes he is. Let's rewind. Encalagon breaks three mountains as he dies, but that doesn't mean he has to be as big as a mountain. There is plenty of evidence that something or someone can do plenty of environmental damage without being colossal in size. The best example, the death of the Balrog, Durin's Bane, as described by Gandalf. I threw down my enemy, and he fell from the high place, and broke the mountainside, where he smote it in his ruin. So when the Balrog died, he broke the mountainside of Zirak Ziggle in his ruin. He didn't bring down the entire mountain, but he clearly did a fair amount of damage. Maybe a giant crater, a rock slide, or an avalanche. We know how big Durin's Bane is. He is, rather boringly, about twice the height of a man. He isn't that big. Nowhere near big enough to be breaking the mountainside when he falls if we're using conventional physics. But he does, because Arda isn't conventional. We're talking about a world where Morgoth screams so loudly that it causes earthquakes. Huan and Karkaroth fighting causes the ground to break and rock slides to occur. Or that the War of Wrath causes so much environmental damage that Beleriand literally breaks apart and sinks into the ocean. Destructive power doesn't necessarily have to come with size. And Caligon could have been filled with so much innate power that him falling onto Fangorodrim might have been the equivalent of dropping an atomic bomb. But maybe you're not convinced. Let's rewind a little bit more. Let's talk about Arundil slaying and Caligon. Now, Arundil was aboard his flying ship, Vingalote, when he slew and Caligon and cast him from the sky. But the act of slaying and Caligon becomes a little hard to fathom when you look at this picture. You can see Vingalote, it's absolutely tiny, and Arundil was obviously smaller than his ship. In fact, you'd even wonder how Arundil even had a chance at all, and Caligon could have just eaten Vingalote in a single bite. Arundil was wearing the Silmaril, and we know that the Silmaril can burn or cause pain to evil beings, but not to the extent of where it would kill them, at least not without prolonged exposure. Unless Arundil had invented something that could project the Silmaril into a giant laser beam, he probably didn't use it to kill Encalagon. The simple reality is that Arundil probably killed Encalagon conventionally, but if Encalagon is that big, you'd need more than a sword. You'd need a railgun or something. Arundil did not have a railgun. He did have eagles though, and Forondor, Lord of the Eagles, was quite big. He had a 55 meter wingspan, but even he would be small compared to that Encalagon. So logically, Encalagon, while still big, had to be small enough where he could be killed conventionally, by a weapon like a sword or a spear, or perhaps thinking bigger, maybe a ballista mounted on the ship. It doesn't mean that he necessarily died from a single wound like Smaug did, it might have taken many, but he would have to be small enough where these wounds would damage him. If he was as big as he is in that picture, even a bolt from a ballista would be little more than a pinprick to him. Still not convinced? Alright. 
Well, let me draw your attention to this line from the Silmarillion. But he loosed upon his foes the last desperate assault that he had prepared, and out of the pits of Angband issued the winged dragons that had not before been seen. Alright, two things to take in from that. The winged dragons emerged from the pits of Angband and they had not been seen before, meaning they had probably never left the pits of Angband. So how does this relate to Ancalagon's size? It means Ancalagon must have also emerged from Angband's pits, which creates an issue. Angband was built beneath Fangorodrim, and if Ancalagon is bigger than Fangorodrim, how the hell can he fit inside Angband? I know, this seems rather comical, but it is a valid point. The logistics of Ancalagon being as big as he is in that picture makes zero sense. How do you house him? How do you feed him? How do you hide him? How do you move him around without him causing cyclonic gusts of wind or earthquakes when he moves? I know that earlier in the video I said that the same laws of physics don't necessarily apply to Arda, but they do to an extent, at least the very basics. If Ancalagon was truly that massive, he probably would have accidentally destroyed Angband and buried Morgoth at some point. Oops. My last point is that Tolkien's scaling, at least when it came to dragons, wasn't that over the top. A sketch of Smaug that Tolkien drew has him scaled to about 18 meters in length, which is significantly smaller than the movie version of Smaug. Tolkien did say that the scaling was off, but the point remains, Smaug wasn't massive, he did die to a single arrow after all. And yes, the black arrow was just a normal arrow. Likewise, Glaurong was small enough to die to a single stab wound, and Scaffa died to a single Northman. Of course, Ancalagon would be bigger than these three, but the point remains. Ancalagon being the size of Fangorodrim would make him a massive anomaly, literally. So if Ancalagon probably wasn't freakishly large, then how big was he? We don't know for sure, and this is why artists take so many liberties with him. There is no correct answer but some answers might be more correct than others. My personal theory is that Ancalagon was probably the size of Forondor, who had a 55 meter wingspan. That's about half the length of a football field, so he'd still be very large, just not absurdly large. My evidence for this comes from the very reason why Morgoth began his slide into evil. He could not create true life, but only mockeries of it. One thing you'll notice about Morgoth's mockeries is that they're never quite as good as the real thing, Orcs aren't as big or strong as elves or men, and trolls aren't as big or strong as Ents if Treebeard is to be believed. We don't actually know the origin of dragons other than the fact that Morgoth bred them, which means they may have been created in mockery of a living creature too. What creature? We're unsure, especially for worms like Glaurung, but the winged dragons in particular have some striking parallels with the eagles. They can, obviously, both fly. They are both very intelligent, and they both prefer to live in the mountains, mostly aloof from other creatures. If Morgoth's creatures can never really be as good as the real things, then it might stand to reason that dragons were, on average, not as powerful as eagles. That doesn't mean that every eagle would be stronger than every dragon, there were greater dragons and lesser dragons, but it might mean that the greatest dragon could not be stronger than the greatest eagle. In other words, Ancalagon, for all his might, might still be weaker than Forondor. That doesn't necessarily mean that he would be smaller than Forondor, but I think it's a reasonable guess. He's still very large, far larger than Smaug or Glaurung, but he's still small enough to, you know, fit inside Angband. So what artwork do I believe would best represent in Caligon? Probably this one. So what do you think? Do you agree or disagree? How big do you think Encalagon is? Remember, this is one of those instances where your guess is as good as mine. And Caligon could be far larger, or perhaps even smaller, he could be the size of Mushu from Mulan, although I can't imagine many will go for that option. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. If you have any suggestions for this series, do post them in the comments below. Thanks, farewell, and remember, bigger isn't always better.